Okay, good morning and welcome to this Green Recovery Festival session, a spotlight talk with David Halpin. My name's Caroline McFarland. Um, I'm director of Common Vision, host of The Crowd. And for those of you that are unfamiliar with The Crowd, um, The Crowd is a network for business leaders to explore and exchange ideas on corporate sustainability and responsible business issues. And the Green Recovery Festival is our fortnight of talks, panels, interactive sessions around how the COVID-19 recovery can be aligned with the transition to a low carbon future. We've been absolutely de delighted to host such a wide variety of topics and experts over the last 10 days or so. We've covered the net zero transition, nature-based solutions, clean transport, green finance, and lots more. And it's been absolutely um, fascinating and a pleasure to see so many um, uh, people join us, familiar faces and new faces too. Um, in terms of the format for this set session, um, I will um, introduce David in a second, um, and then after a short presentation from David, we will open up to Q&A. Um, if you are, have joined us in Zoom, please use the Q&A function and feel free to ask questions you know, from, from now. Um, don't forget to say who you are and your organisational affiliation if you have one. Um, we're also streaming on YouTube and other social media channels. So if you want to ask a question from there, use the hashtags the crowd and hashtag David Halpern and our team will feed in those questions. Um, so um, just before we kick off, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Charities Aid Foundation, Adnams and the RIBA. If you'd like to find out about sponsorship of the crowds, events and COP26 related activities next year, do get in touch. Right, so um, let's, um, let's, let's start the discussion today. David Halpern is the Chief Executive of the Behavioural Insights Team, where he, which he has led since its inception in 2010. Prior to that, David was the first research director of the Institute for Government and chief analyst at the Prime Minister's Strategy Unit. Um, David was also appointed as the What Works National Advisor in July 2013, um, supporting efforts to improve the use of evidence across government. Um, so lots to talk about. And we've asked David to particularly speak about how lessons in behavioural science from the crisis might be applicable to future interventions relating to climate change and the zero carbon transition. Um, so over to you, David. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Caroline. So I guess now would be time to share my screen, some slides. Thank you. Um, it's wonderful to talk. I know we're going to talk a bit about COVID, but actually um, it's wonderful to talk about something um, actually other than COVID as well. Um, and what are we going to cover? Okay. All right, there we go. Um, a very brief introduction to behavioral insights, um, for those of you who don't know anything about that. Um, I'll talk a little bit about behavioral insights and COVID, um, and then I'm going to spend most of the time talking about using behavioral insights for sustainability. And then if we get a few moments, talk about some of the frontier issues, which are also the bridges between the two. I thought I might just start with actually a completely different example, which reminded me of, um, Ms. Carol, I mentioned, um, I've been kicking around policy for a long time. I did used to be a respectable academic years ago um, at Cambridge. But the uh, um, but when I worked for Tony Blair, um, I did six years in the strategy or whatever, we did have a go at pushing behavioral science in that period too. And I re remember, um, and for some reason this talk reminded me of it, this conversation with um, then... Um, very influential spad, uh, Paul Corrigan, who was um, working for the Secretary of State at the time, later in number 10. And we were talking about using, we'd done a report on using behavioral insights, um, uh, behavioral approaches basically to affect behavior change in lots of areas. And one of which, of course, is obvious things like public health and smoking. I remember talking to him about it. We were in the Department of Health. And, um, and uh, so I'm going through these kind of various angles that we could use. And, and Paul leans over to him and he says, what? What what is this? What are you talking about? You know, you know, using kind of uh, these other kinds of approaches or incentives to help people do something like quit smoking. And he says, the thing is, if you don't quit smoking, it's probably going to kill you. Like, what more incentive could you possibly have or need in order to quit smoking? But then, as we all kind of know, I think, welcome to a world of human beings. 
um, we aren't purely rational. Um, and in fact, one of the things we've done um, in the period of the coalition government is, some of you may know, the Pavel Insights team took a, at the, very, at the time, very controversial position in 2011, which is that in the UK, we should make e-cigarettes widely available because they basically give you a behavioral substitute and whatever we can talk about the ins and outs of it. But to cut a long story short, I mean, I think the evidence is now very, very persuasive that e-cigarettes are, are significantly more effective as a quit route. They have helped to give the UK um, basically one of the, the lowest now smoking rates in the industrialized world um, and has saved you know, huge numbers of people. And we're gonna talk about COVID in a minute, but it's worth bearing in mind, look, it's, COVID is absolutely terrible. More than a million people killed um, or died from it this year. But how many people, by the way, die from smoking? Um, in the year that this year alone will probably be 7 million, roughly. In Britain alone, close to 80,000 people will die from smoking. But the, the point I mainly want to make about it is that it gives you a glimpse into, you know, how human beings think and work. It's not that smokers don't know smoking is bad for them. Of course they do. But um, it's very hard to shift behavior. Even when it's palpably obvious, it may be bad for you and bad for others. So two systems, for those who don't know, here's a quick 101 introduction. Danny Kahneman, um, Thinking Fast and Slow, if you haven't read it, but basically two kinds of systems, thinking fast, um, automatic, intuitive things, driving on a regular route, two by two, you know, two times two, it feels effortless, right? Um, and that's how a lot of our behavior is driven, so-called system one, as opposed to system two, slow, deliberative, reflective, um, and, um, you know, 24 times 17, learning to drive or driving to somewhere which is less familiar to you, it is effortful. Um, and that we tend to, particularly in the policy world, think about the world as if it was all system two, whereas that actually a lot of the action is in system one, right? Kind of on autopilot and particularly using short, mental shortcuts or heuristics to drive our behavior. The idea of what happened in, um, back in 2010 in particular with the coalition government, um, this is the wording in the coalition agreement, find intelligent ways to encourage support and enable people to make better choices for themselves. Um, and that was essentially the mantra for the behavioral insights team as was set up in number 10. Um, we had a little help from our friends, not least people like uh, Richard Thaler, um, who himself got the Nobel Prize um, in 2017, uh, not least partly on the back of the work which we were doing together. So, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of people have been involved in this initiative, not just us. Often subject to some kinds of jokes and humor. Um, it's true, but on the other hand, not a very funny joke, you might think. Um, but um, actually, despite that, even though it seems like a quirky thing, it has basically been, and as I'll try and show you, a highly effective tool um, in relation to policy, or indeed, if you get policy, in terms of firms or individuals trying to shape their own behavior, if we understand human beings a little better. Um, and you can read about that in books such as Inside the Nudge Unit, um, a summary if you're, if you're curious, as well as our, our reports, which we put out on a regular basis. So it's been applied to lots of areas, um, tax collection, economic growth, um, health, we'll talk about some of those things, obviously sustainability, education, policing, almost anything you might think of in policy turns out to be about human beings and their behavior. What a surprise. We've also combined it with something which is maybe equally important but less obvious to um, <laughs> the rest of the world, which is just a very, very strong form of empiricism, in particular the use of randomized controlled trials and quasi experimental um, techniques. And that's partly because human beings are really complicated. What influences our behavior? Many, many factors. We should approach it with humility and actually find out not what we think will happen, but what does actually work. Um, and it has also scaled across the world. For those who don't know, the Behavioral Insights team is a, is a weird and wonderful creature these days. It's um, a social purpose company co-owned by the cabinet office, by the innovation charity Nesta and by employees. And that's enabled us to be able to respond to requests from other parts of the world, other governments, um, and sometimes companies, um, uh, in order to try and make, make the world a better place. Okay, on to COVID. The world is temporarily closed. Um, yes. One of the main points about that, by the way, which will um, is a clear lesson to take across to climate change, is that behavioral scientists are really interested, we'll talk about it in a bit more detail in a minute, but in timely interventions, things which disrupt your normal habits. You know, so when the tube strikes occur over two days, a few years ago, you might remember them, about one in 20 people who are regular commuters 
never went back to the previous route. You might think, my God, what, what was that? They've been commuting for years, but it took the disruption of a two day strike to make them realize, oh God, you know, this is annoying. I'm gonna have to walk. Oh, you know what? It turns out walking is pretty good. Um, and disruptions in habits are a key moment when you can affect behavior change. And boy, we have all, and the world has clearly experienced the mother of all such disruptions. So I don't want to spend too long on it, COVID, but I will just briefly just draw out. Maybe it's obvious, but um, if you think about it, um, essentially behavioral elements are involved in so-called first, second, and third line of defense against an infectious disease. And I'll quickly go through some of those. So first line is things like, what are the behaviors we can just ask you to do straight away, like washing your hands, um, wear a mask, and so on. Then um, beyond that, even if we start to do things like we're now asking you, for example, you, you tested positive, will you please stay at home? That becomes a compliance issue, essentially a behavioral one. How do we make that actually work? Um, and then even when you've got your kind of treatments, let's suppose it's mass testing, but you know it can be when the vaccinations are involved, will, will anyone turn up, right? That itself becomes a behavioral issue or is a behavioral issue. Um, so I'll just quickly scan through some examples at some pace. Um, first line of defense, well, hands face space. That's um, something we were certainly pretty centrally involved in. Hands face space is itself um, a short form way of expressing a complicated idea. Um, and for those who can remember a few months ago in the spring and summer, one of the issues was just even encapsulating those most basic things which we're asking people to do. And hands face space may not sound very complicated, but a lot of work went into how can you compress within what's called the articulatory loop, that little tiny bit of about two seconds um, in, in your mind. You know, if someone says a number to you, five, six, seven, eight, you can play it back like a little bit of tape. It's called the articulatory loop. So trying to compress the message right down to almost basically a, a phrase that people will remember. And hands face space is an attempt to do that essentially these are some things we're asking everyone to do on a regular basis. Um, there are other layers to it, and just to kind of pull back the curtain a little bit. This is on one of those early things around, if you can remember, right back to February, March, one of the most basic things people were asked to do early on was to wash your hands, partly on the back of some very large studies that were done at 20,000 N around showing that if you do wash your hands more frequently, it does indeed reduce transmission for a number of diseases, not only protect yourself, but those in, in the household. And we tested a whole number of posters um, and um, so this was like a, a trial where we test several thousand people, like 6,000. They see different posters. They just see one of them. And then they're asked, basically, after seeing that for a little while, a few questions about it. Like, what can they remember? What did it say? It's basically 101 stuff to try and test well, what actually drives the absorption of the message. Um, oh, I haven't got the whole details here. But um, essentially what you would see is that some of the earlier versions look like this. You can see my cursor moving or this, and they said things like, is NHS, coronavirus, action plan, et cetera, because they're drawn up in government. Um, and then there's all the details here. Well, actually it was no, you can imagine, why do we say action plan? Who, what's an action plan? Who cares about that? What's your actual ask? So essentially what happens is they evolve over time through our trialing until they look like this. And this is what most people would have seen a version of it like this. So by, by the time it's moved from this to this, a lot of this text is gone. This, you know, essentially you're drawing attention to the, why, why say action plan? Why not just say the main thing we're asking you is wash your hands more often and for 20 seconds. If that's your main message, if that's what you should say, write it large. Also the image changes too. Like, what is this? What is this thing going on? It's actually hands holding on, you know, obviously viewed through UV um, on the underground, et cetera. Some people struggling to see what that is. Sometimes it might be your own hands, someone's different. This is just one simpler image, it's more effective. So as you move from this to this, you can basically substantially improve memory and comprehension of the primary message. So you can evolve essentially to be, you know, get your main message across more effectively. Um, second line of defense. Well, a good example would be um, a key issue is, is, is self-isolation. So you've had a test or whatever, you know, are you gonna self-isolate, are you not? Well, if we send you a text saying, this is what you got to do, um, isn't more effective than for example, calling you up or many other combinations. Those of you who know the political literature will know will recognize some of these results actually is quite, quite similar. Um, in essence, I won't go through the full detail, but we found often sending people lots of texts was not more effective, often ineffective, even occasionally backfired, as opposed to actually calling someone up was much, much more effective. 
In retrospect, that might seem obvious, but actually empirically, it's not obvious until you test it. So that then drives changes in the test and trace system to improve its efficacy and to improve compliance. Another example right now, of course, a lot of discussion around mass testing. Those who read our blogs and so on will realize that we've been looking very closely at places like Slovakia. Why have we done that? Well, it's all very well having millions of tests, but if no one turns up for the tests, you know, let alone if no one complies with the self-isolation if they're positive, or even if they, if you give people a test and then they're like, oh, great, I can go out and party, that's a problem. So Slovakia is particularly interesting because they tested the whole population essentially in um, a weekend and then they repeated it. But they also achieved more than 90% of um, 10 to 65 year olds turning up. And they do this through a whole series of mechanisms, including particular incentives. And as we kind of adopt some of those strategies in the UK, not least at a local level, it's really important to learn those lessons. Um, even third line, when you got your vaccination, you're like, fantastic, we're across the line. Well, not necessarily, because if people don't turn up, right, or they don't comply, or they're worried about the vaccination, et cetera, then actually it doesn't you know, work. So I'll take you an example from another domain, um, which is TB, tuberculosis. Um, I don't know if you know, um, but again, tuberculosis kills more than a million people every year. And one of the reasons why it, it does this, what we should say it's puzzling, is that we, we've had a treatment for TB going back to the 1940s. It's basically antibiotics and so on. So how can it be so many people die? Well, some don't have access to treatment, but a key issue is that when you start being treated, you feel a bit better. And then people don't persist with the treatment. And that's not exactly the same. We'll see what the vaccines, how they play out. But often, you know, you have to have more than one jab, et cetera. But just to focus on TB for a minute, that's really a, a big problem. It's not enough to say you've got a treatment's effective if people then don't take the pills, right? And then they die. So one of the things that's uh, done, a way in which it's treated, is it's what's called directly observed treatment. So it's become you know, you're supposed to take your pills and literally be seen, witnessed taking your pills before you get your next treatment. Um, that's a real pain you can imagine. So we ran a trial um, where instead of having to literally go into a clinic and be observed, is why can't you use your phone um, and as it were, just quickly do a video clip here, I'm taking my pill, whatever, um, and then you get your pills. Um, and, and could we achieve higher compliance? Well, in short, the answer is yes. Um, basically, how many people actually were seen, observed, doing it? This is um, uh, with non-adherence. And the key one you might look at if over here is proposed days, um, you know, basically adherence, essentially. And you can, with video observed instead of directly observed, you can get much, much higher compliance rate, right? Um, and then actually that makes all the difference, particularly if you can get to 80%, which is what we managed to do. So, and often COVID, I've already mentioned one of the key lessons, which is disruption of behavior, but there's some other ones and I'm, gonna, I'm a bit aware of the time, but let me just rattle through some things. We sometimes use this very simple mnemonic called EAST, if you want to think about shifting behavior. And, um, you know, it might seem a little bit crass, but saving the planet actually also rests on similar things. So easy, attractive, social, timely, and I'll quickly rattle through some examples um, on each of these. Um, easy. Uh, Again, you might not need a PhD in behavioral science, but be obsessed about frictional factors if you want to affect a behavior change. Um, the most famous example, of course, is auto-enrollment on pensions. Um, it was thought for many years that Anglo-Saxon, Brits and so on wouldn't save. It just turned out it's not about saving, even though we spend billions and billions on tax subsidies, not very effective. People just can't be bothered to fill in a form. We've got better things to do. And when you shift it from being an opt-in to an opt-out, we see results that look like this. Essentially, people, when they come up to the renewal point um, and it's an opt out instead of an opt in, you typically get about 90 percent of people stick with the default. And by the way, even the, those who opt out still say you should set the default that way. Um, the same is also true um, in relation to um, green. So um, we've done some trials. Others have done it, too. This is around if you ask people on their bills to opt in versus opt out to a green tariff. And it is just, as you can see, pretty much order of magnitude type difference, much bigger often than people think it will be. It's just enormously powerful, taking away that friction. Um, 
another example would be in general around lots of consumption issues is we just use these kind of mental shortcuts. A very famous one is called the Goldilocks effect. If you say, hey, what kind of coffee do you want? And Caroline goes to get her fancy whatever Americano in the morning. Um, most people basically choose the middle option. So the calories option. So here's, you know, here's your different sizes. In this particular experiment, what happens is that they then knock out, this is a, obviously often seen in commercial practice, they remove the smallest option um, and replace it with a big one. By the way, if you ask people, why do you choose the middle one? They say, oh, well, you know, the big one would just be too much for me and that one's a little bit too small, hence Goldilocks. But when you just switch it over, so on Monday morning it's changed and this one has gone and it's moved to that, right? So the mediums become the small and so on and so on. What's the calories ordered? It immediately shifts up because people don't remember um, the difference, the absolute, they're driven by the relativities, right? So these are very powerful forces driving human behavior. Okay, attractive, breakthrough. Actually the background message um, images itself on, it's actually for those who know Australia, this is Southern Cross Station. Um, and there was a wonderful intervention with the organization we worked with the uh, um, public, um, no, it was a matter of a public health organization, Victoria, um, in Victoria. And by putting this wonderful artwork on the stairs, the question is, would it make a difference? And um, so it's a big staircase and to the side of it and elsewhere, you can just see at the edge of the image, there are these escalators. What you found is putting this image here, increased the number of people who took the steps during rush hour by about 25%. And in off peak period, more than doubled the number of people who took the steps. Just because it, hey, it looks nice. Right. Here's another example. One of the best things, of course, we could do to save the planet is get people to eat less red meat. But for quite a few people, you say vegetarian. Actually, mm, do I want to do that? So here's a trial we ran, which is just to do with a breakfast. It's a vegetarian breakfast and different ways of describing it. So if we call it meat free, a meat free breakfast, you can see about 7% of people chose it. If, on the other hand, we call it something else, you get a lot more people. So if, for example, calling it field grown, it's roughly twice as attractive, twice as many people will choose it than if we call it meat free, right? Might seem a small thing, but that's quite a big difference when you amplify it across an economy. And there's a lot of things you can do. This is around sugar. You can try, you know, these trials we've run around. Label, does it make a difference? Yeah, big label saying high sugar, about 7% um, reduction. This is one around changing the position. And so putting the high sugar options a bit more, you know, top shelf or a little bit out of sight, you get almost perfect substitution to healthier options. This is one using price, changing the prices in vending machines. And we show that a 20% increase on the higher sugar versions leads to a 10% 10, 10 reduction in their consumption um, and almost perfect substitution again. Um, this is one just going into the next section, which is some we might have seen us written about, which is if you're buying, you know, uh, EVs, one of the ways you might do it to normalize it um, and make them more attractive is that you have something which is relatively obvious, a visible symbol, right? Which itself then becomes um, a statement, an identity issue, as well as triggers goes on to the next section, which is social. So we are very influenced about what our behavior, by what other people are doing. Psychologists call it um, declarative social norms. It's not what the rules are, but what you think other people are doing. And this is true for littering and many other, many other behaviors. It's also true for tax, one of our early and quite famous trials is obviously wouldn't apply to any of you guys, but um, for people who are late paying their tax. So we tested just adding an extra line on an already simplified letter. In this case, just telling people something which is true. So these people are late paying their tax, but we say nine out of 10 people pay their tax on time. But does it make a difference to how people pay? This is the control group. And this is the number of people who pay without further prompt at 20, by 23 days. About roughly a month. Um, adding that extra line, yes, notches not, not it up by a couple of percentage points, just under. If we say, not nine out of 10 people in general, but most people in your area pay their tax on time, even better because they're people who are like you. If we say, you're one of the few yet to pay, up again. If we say, most people in your area pay their tax on time, you're one of the few yet to do, it's now a five percentage point increase or a 15% increase in the number who pay without further prompts. Very influenced by what other people are doing. Um, a very famous example, many will know, O-Power, social comparisons in relation to showing people similarly how much energy their neighbors are using. A key part of that is to show you 
relative to your more efficient neighbors rather than average to avoid what are called backfire effects. Um, and what the kind of effects we see generally in the range, you know, one and a half to three and a half percent reduction. Is that a big deal? Well, to use price alone, you're going to have to use a kind of 20 percent price movement to get an effect size of this um, magnitude. And um, we've replicated that similarly elsewhere. Here's one just from Moldova, actually, for example, where we compare the effectiveness of telling people about um, the um, this has got two arms to it. This is how much energy you use relative to others. And this is how much you spend relative to others. That might not look very much, but basically it's pretty much spot on the 2% reduction that you'd see in the OPOWER trials. And it's very quick. Timely, well, I already mentioned earlier, COVID is the classic example of disruption. If you're a behavioral scientist, or in fact, anyone you should be interested in, where are people's behavior disrupted is a key moment that you can try and affect a change, especially if it's a habit-based behavior. Again, the background is a kind of fun, <laughs> but a familiar example. Um, this is Google searches for the word diet. And it, you can see it looks like a heartbeat. You see that bouncing up and down? This is a yearly cycle for a decade. And you can guess what this is. This actually more or less is this time of year. And what is this? This is after Christmas. This is Christmas every year. So no point talking to people about diets here. They're like, oh, whatever, I'm tired. I wanna go and binge out. Come January, that's when people are thinking about diet. If you're really keen eyed, you'll notice there's actually a normally a second bump. Um, and you can see that is more variable. That depends on the weather. Why is that? This is spring. Oh my God, I'm gonna be going on my summer holiday. Jesus Christ, I'm gonna be on the beach. I better go on a diet. Yes, timing matters. Okay, here's a couple of examples. Getting people to make modal shifts in transport. So again, transport is a classic example. It's very habit-based. Even going to do face-to-face -face interviews to do travel, travel plans of individuals often doesn't work very well, except, key exception is, if someone's just moved house, right? Why is that? Because if you just moved house, you haven't established quite yet your new habits, right? That's the moment where you can get someone to make a modal shift. So here's an experimental example from our work in US cities with Bloomberg, um, which is new cycle stations coming into place. And we basically, so an email trial or whatever to get people, if they want to sign up, we compare the effectiveness of having a new station come to your area, right? Well, that's a bit of a disruption. Number of people who sign up, not very many. In contrast, new movers, right? In other words, you've moved house, number of people who will respond to an email prompt, you can see order of magnitude bigger. Still, it's quite a small effect, this is a, it's, um, an email trial, but it gives you a sense of how this works as a mechanism. Um, similarly, getting people to switch their energy suppliers, often it's like, oh, no one will ever move, there's no point, they're all completely inert. If you do it at the right moment and a prompt, so this is an off tram trial we did a couple of years ago, and you actually put in their hands at the point just before they're due um, for a change, can you make a difference? This is a number of people who switch, by the way. This is sticky customers. You can see basically no one. When you do this arm where we basically say, oh, look, here we are. Here's some alternatives that come from Ofgem. And by the way, here's from your supplier. We twisted the arm of a supplier saying, here's some alternative tariffs. You can get a kind of threefold. It's still quite low percentages, but this is enough to start to change a market dynamic. Fine, that's the amounts of um, getting switched to a supplier, but can we do it also for an energy consumption issue the answer is yes. So here's a trial we ran a few years ago with John Lewis, actually, if I remember correctly, um, where we just tweak the labels to change for salience a little bit. And it's very simple. So this is like for a tumble dryer or whatever. And control stores is a standard thing. The treatment stores, it's basically the same, but we just make a little bit bigger this box, which just shows the lifetime costs. That's all it is. It's a tiny little tweak. Does it make a difference? Yeah, it does. Um, it basically makes people switch at the margin towards more expensive but more efficient machines if you increase the profile of it. Um, all right, now some of those changes might seem small. You think, well, will that save the planet? The answer is it actually can. So here's from a recent meta-analysis from our work actually in the US alone by a couple of academics who look both at our US team, which is New York based in Washington, and only looks at very sort of narrow nudges, kind of small prompts and letters like some of the ones I've shown you. And it also 
um, combines both our work with that of the White House team, a sort of tribute team, a similar one, the OES. And over 350 interventions um, involving, I think, 24 million people, quite a lot of, uh, we do quite a lot of trials. Um, this is the average effect size across all of them. So some calls work, some don't, 8%. This is just narrow nudges. This is not more elaborate things. Is that worth doing? Eight percent is pretty damn big. Imagine you can go to any area and you can get someone to shift or move up eight percent or down. That's actually quite a big deal, particularly given that you don't have to only do it once. You can then repeat and get another eight percent, another eight percent, another eight percent. And those margins are very important in finely balanced markets. So let's just have a look at one last example before we, um, I think, before we wind up. Um, this is a famous map called the obesity map. Um, produced by Go Science, Government Office of Science, a number of years ago in Britain. And it tries to map all the drivers that affect obesity. And you can just see it looks like a plate of spaghetti. It's horribly complex. And it led to a lot of people to think there's nothing we can do because the system is so complex. If I would do this bit, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Another way of interpreting this is if you can work out the key pressure points in this dynamic about which behaviors you can just shift at the margin that create a tipping point, right? and particularly what we call a double nudge. And I'm gonna give you the example of the sugar levy, which you might be unsurprised, but something which we worked on. I mentioned earlier those micro trials, which work out just what can prompt a degree of substitution um, from a, one drink to another. And essentially that's what we take that micro evidence and we try and work out what would tip the whole market. So this is going back about four years ago, levels of sugar in British drinks. And you can see they vary quite a bit. Um, but if we particularly look at, if we've got them here, lemonades, here's a selection of lemonades. There's seven up versus Sprite versus Schweppes. And actually, if you look down here, also Tesco lemonade. So different lemonades actually have very different levels of sugar. But my guess is most of you, and indeed most people in public, were not really aware of and couldn't confidently have said how much sugar there was in these different things. It's written on the labels, it has been for years, right? But it doesn't mean anyone reads them. But we do know how much of a price difference will move people, how many consumers. We also know that retailers don't like to have stock on the shelves, which is selling a bit slower because they'll switch to one which is selling a bit faster. So we basically design a two level levy, um, those don't know the detail of it, at eight grams and at six grams. And you can see why we're doing this, partly because it's going under how the drink is made. So these are basically all sugar drinks. These are often mixed ones like you know, Coke Life or whatever. And these are ones which substantially use um, non-sugar. Um, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to drive essentially reformulation by moving a small number of marginal consumers, which actually tips the manufacturers to reformulate. Does it work? Oh my God, absolutely. This is what happened to those lemonades. You wanna look at a few more? Here's some others. So what we're talking about, roughly 45 million kilograms of sugar removed every year. And we're now running at um, you know, close to 30% reductions in sugar. Um, interestingly, drink sales increase over the same time. So why is that so important? Is you can use these mechanisms to drive reformulation, which do most of the heavy lifting for the consumers, even if you don't read the label, because the reformulation is doing the heavy lifting. And it doesn't put manufacturers out of business. It drives manufacturers to use their innovation to come up with better products. You can do this in other areas. I won't go through the detail. You can do it around trip advisors, you know, for whatever. You can do it for, you know, internet providers, et cetera. So what we call deshrouding markets. You can basically, if you're careful enough about your pressure points, you can make, you can move enough consumer behavior to tip whole markets. Um, all right, in conclusion, I mean, this is a pretty simple conclusion, really. But I think, and I hope our kids will look back and just say like, oh my God, guys, what did you used to do? The weird way used to do policy on the basis of people are all these kind of rational econs, as they're called. We're not that, actually. Of course, you know, price does make a difference and so on. I've illustrated that. But actually, lots of other factors alter human behavior. And also, we have to be very empirical and test and run A-B formats and so on. If we do that, we, can, we genuinely can save the planet. I mean, I honestly believe that. I'm quite optimistic about it. But we do have to get our heads around actual human beings, not what it says in the economics textbook. All right, I will stop there. I'm sorry, Caroline, that took a little bit longer, but um, hopefully it was some useful content. I'll stop sharing now.
Absolutely. Thank you so much, David, for that whistle stop tour of um, all things Nudge. Really, really fascinating. And there's lots and lots of um, read across to what our attendees do. I know we've got lots of questions um, coming in. Um, if you do want to ask a question, um, you can use the Q&A box down there in Zoom if you're in Zoom. Or um, if you're on social media, use hashtag the crowd and hashtag David Halpin and we'll feed those questions in. Um, just before I go to some of the Q&A, um, one, one question around what the coronavirus crisis has done for behavioural science as a, I suppose, as a discipline um, and its effect on policymaking. Because um, there's definitely, it was definitely important to have public infrastructure as a crucial response to COVID, but so many other things were also dependent on human behaviour. Do you think it's elevated the um, the influence of behavioural science for, for at, a, at a sort of government and policy level? And then the second thing I wanted to ask you, David, was around, um, you briefly mentioned incentives, and um, we have seen sort of governments thinking creatively around the world about how they use incentives to encourage compliance and overcome stigma and, you know, address the somewhat more hard economic realities um, that people have been, you know, affected by um, the crisis in, in, in many sort of financial ways. Um, what do you have any sort of insights on how else incentives can be used, particularly with the sort of climate change sustainability um, angle? Yeah, very good. Thank you. Um, on the first question around COVID and behavioural science, I think it has increased its profile, certainly in the minds of some. Um, so many of my, um, you know, medical, biomedical colleagues, of course, Chris, Witty, Patrick, um, you know, they, they're well aware of these, you know, huge amounts of behavioural issues to it. Um, and, but there is still an asymmetry, frankly, and there's an asymmetry which is built into not just policy, but actually the underlying research base. There is something linked to SAGE called SPY B, you may know, um, which has behavioral scientists, which also input fantastic people like James Rubin at King's and others. Um, but it, it it's true to a point. So I think it's reminded people, as I've just showed you on first, second, third line of the fence. Um, but, um, but there's still this, you know, if you look at our, our research base, you know, um, what UKRI and others fund, we spend billions and billions on running big clinical trials and so on and so on. Um, but I think we still tend to think, oh yeah, but the human bit, everybody, oh, I'm a human being, everyone's a human being, and therefore you sort of think, well, I understand therefore human behavior. But it's quite a profound thing to realize that, um, actually we know to some extent we are strangers to ourselves, right? In relation to what drives our own behavior. And this, I think, continues to, to surprise people, including policymakers, that why aren't people doing this? Why, aren't they, do, why are they doing this other thing? Uh, but also to realize that you have to apply really the same rigor um, and effort to try and understand human behavior that you would do to understanding what, what makes a vaccine effective or not. So I think it's a sort of half full, half empty. So it's half full in the sense that you often now see people on the news and you'll often see if you look under their tag, it'll say behavioral scientist. Um, but in terms of the kind of the corresponding shift or level of effort and detail, I think it's still not there. And you'd see the same on climate change, right? Lots and lots of effort around the technical solutions, the magic, of course we have to have that around, you know, better, more efficient electric vehicles, et cetera. But you still have to say, well, what actually makes people switch to the electric vehicle? What makes that modal, you know? And then you have to unpack human behavior um, and you have to apply the same level of rigor to it, sometimes known at the very least as the um, the last mile issues, right? 80% of products fail because people don't adopt them, but technically they work. What's wrong with all you people, you know? On the incentives point, yes. So let's not overstate the issue. Um, classical economics still has a role. Financial incentives make a difference, but it's that um, it's getting into the nuance of it. So I gave you the example of the sugar levy and people often think, well, that's just a financial incentive. It's not, it's a huge amount of work went into the design of that levy and it's highly effective. And it's highly effective because it works in terms of the, the behavioral substitution that occurs on the part of the individual and also how the market works, the behavior of the various actors. And that was studied in great detail. Because to put it the other way, there are loads of such so-called syntaxes which have been found to be epic fails, 
So fat taxes are a good example, as done in some of the Nordic countries um, and so on. And why don't they work? Well, they look the same, but, but they're not the same because the substitutions are different. So it works in relation to drinks, for example, because, look, here's my, here's a, here's my Diet Coke. Um, because Diet Coke is a reasonably good substitute versus full sugar, right? Whereas when you try and do the substitute with fat, and it sounds kind of small detail, but it's absolutely a killer. What do you, if you take the fat out, what do you put instead? Or certainly in relation to, maybe I should be more precise, trying to do a sugar tax in relation to solid foods is much more difficult. Because if you take the sugar out and then you put fat in, actually it's more calories, right? And then you've got, you know, et cetera, et cetera, or what the substitution. So it, it, it matters greatly. And there are examples where taxes work very, very well. There are examples where they flop. And it depends on very substantially on the behavioral substitutions. So are there loads more? Absolutely, there are loads more. Um, that, um, maybe we'll, we'll talk about one or two, including on climate change. Yeah, thank you. Um, so there's a question about um, where behavioural nudges can work hand in glove with new technologies. And you mentioned again with, with COVID, the track and trace stuff, but um, obviously that, um, that, that was a double edged, edged sword in some ways. Um, so do you have any examples of, um, you know, rolling out new tech um, well? Um, and then there's another question on um, the extent to which um, behavioural nudges rely on the media's interpretation. The media's interpretation, that's interesting. Um, yeah, let me deal with the first one. Um, obviously we have, we're have we very interested around the whole innovation space and technology. Um, and of, of course it creates lots of opportunities. Um, it, not least because you can make things much, much easier. Um, I mean, one of the most exciting areas if I had to choose around how we're gonna save the planet. Um, and I know Mark Carney and of course others are, are also looking at this in relation to COP26 is, you know, we want to do is you want to make a smaller ask of people, but which will have disproportionate impact, right? So <laughs> you won't be surprised by this example, Caroline, but you know, the, for most people, the best thing they could do to save the planet, yeah, fine, don't use plastic straws when you're in an Islington bar or whatever, great. But actually more importantly is if you could click on your pension or your pension provider and say, can you please decarbonize my investments? Um, now that's, surprisingly difficult to do for most people because it's just literally not set up in that way. And even previous work on pensions, you know, if you've moved between jobs, even to assemble what are all your pension pots and the amount of money in them, let alone the investments, remains remarkably difficult because of various frictions and obstructions in the way the market is constructed. Um, but in principle, if you can do it, and there are players we're working, for example, with Nest and others on these kind of issues, so that you could just say, oh yeah, can I just click here? You know, it won't take you very long. And what it does is it starts to change, of course, values and markets and have knock-on consequences. It can truly change the world. But the only way you do that is you actually have to have a tech solution, which makes it possible to assemble all that information about what are those investments and how they built into yours. I obviously I made the point earlier on around defaults, which way is the default? Is it opt-in? Is it opt-out? They seem like they're small changes, but across the market, they are utter game changers, right? So there are clearly examples where the use of technology, especially around frictions, can be a game changer. Um, and it's also true around, you know, de-shrouding markets, which I touched on um, earlier. Um, and there are many other examples as well. Um, and, uh, and if we've got time, I'm happy to go back to other ones like, you know, uh, electric vehicles or whatever it would be, but um, yeah. Um, you also asked about the media um, and public, maybe it's a media and public response, really. Um, I mean, again, let me step back a tiny bit on it. Um, so I suspect, I don't know how many people who joined today, like, do they love it? Do they hate it? A lot of us, you might feel slightly ambivalent about nudge techniques. There's often has been a genuine ambivalence, right? Because it feels like, you know, is it somehow, like, are we kind of getting to people's heads and whatever? Um, and when I mentioned at the beginning of it, actually right at the start, about when we had the Blair administration and we were doing this work, it basically flopped big time, um, partly because of media reactions. And it, it actually in, in, inside the Nudge Unit, I do um, give a, a, a brief discussion because I think it's still important. Um, so when we did this paper for the PM Strategy Unit years ago, 2003, I think it was, um, 
around using behavioral techniques to shift behavior, it actually flopped on a number of things. And not least it flopped on, um, we made a one line reference, funny enough, to food taxes. Um, and it ended up on the front of the Times saying, you know, Prime Minister Strategy Unit proposes fat taxes, blah, blah, blah. It was, you know, a kind of shitstorm as uh, periodically occur. And the media reaction to it basically meant that Tony at the time just felt like this is, we just can't do this. This is nanny state on speed. And it was, you know, a disaster. So it didn't marry with the politics, et cetera. It basically flopped big time. And you might say it practically put it back a decade, the use of these techniques in the UK. So it does obviously matter. It's not a large end the study, but does it marry into where people are at? And in particular, is it something which we are doing to people or will we bring them along? So one of the ways, having had that searing experience, we try to be much, much more careful about the positioning of some of the sugar levy work. I personally have long been a big believer, as you may know, in, and I think you are, this is kind of manifestation of it, in deliberative events of other kinds, which enable the public, as it were, to shape what's sometimes called the choice architecture, which in turn shapes them. So if we go back to the simple example of when you're at the checkout with your kids, and we know that, you know, if there's a load of chocolate and sweets by it, you've gone around the supermarket, it was hard work and whatever. And then your kids say, oh, can I have one of those? It's very hard to resist, right? But did you choose to have the chocolate by the checkout? You know, that, that parent didn't choose that, right? That was driven by market forces and so on. And if you can put that choice back to consumers, would you rather have chocolate or something else by the, the checkout, or at least give us guilt-free aisles. So if I'm there with my kids, can I see the guilt-free aisles and go through those ones? And I won't have the pesky power, right? And when you present it in that way, and particularly we've literally done deliberate events on it, the public are like, well, can we change that? Can we not have it there? And in fact, often they were supportive of levies and so on. So I think it does matter who nudges the nudges, right? And you have to have the kind of true democratic process. And the same will be true around green. Is it a small elite who says, you know, we know best, you've got to all eat your greens? Or can you have a, as part of the process, something which enables at least samples of the public to see what are the forces driving your behavior? Let them shape that choice architecture. Um, if you see what I mean. So you can then shape the forces that are shaping your own behavior in the same way that if you want to control your diet, you know, you'll learn, don't bring all the cookies with you when you're sat in front of the TV. Leave them in the kitchen. So you, it's a micro example of shaping your own environment to then in turn shape your own you know, behavior. But we have to also do that at a collective level. Thank you. Um, I'm going to try and squeeze um, a few more questions in. I'm just aware of time. Um, so Paul Dinsdale asks, um, what are the key differences in using nudges with different social groups um, and demographics? So um, under 35 year olds versus 50 plus, for example, and do younger people respond better to nudges by government? Um, Paul Spence is asking about the sort of bigger, less easy household decisions. Um, we need to find ways to persuade around 25 million householders to shift away from gas boilers if we're going to decarbonize heat. And this is currently a more expensive upfront um, option with more disruption in the home. Um, and then Marissa is asking about um, ways to reduce household food waste, which has um, environmental consequences, but um, ensure it doesn't hamper obesity messaging. So I think, you know, the, the way that some of these messages cross cut over um, one another. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. And then I think there's maybe there might be time for one more batch. All right, fine, I'll try and do it relatively briskly. There was also, I think, a question I saw from Terry Apter, um, hi, Terry, um, around, uh, which relates to the demographics, which is, uh, her question is more about pensions, I saw, but, um, you know, do younger people, do certain demographics, do they respond differently to the messages? Um, as it were, that's the kind of the more advanced, you know, not only does it work in general terms, but does it work better for others? I mean, I gave you the example, one area we have looked at in quite detail, you know, over the years, is around tax, where you work out, well, you know, is it true that some messages work better for others? And the answer is, actually, we often found a lot of them work pretty evenly, which was quite strikingly. So that message about, you know, most people pay their tax on time, you're one of the few yet to do so, worked pretty well across most populations. But there were still some differences. 
Um, to just run with that example because it's well, and I explain why actually there's some limitations to, to how well we can answer this question. Um, so we found that, um, you know, if you think about even paying your taxes is to some extent habit based. So um, these interventions often work particularly well for people who are starting paying their taxes because they haven't formed their new habits. And one of the lessons would be if you're at the HMRC, if you're a, someone who's just starting to do self-assessment or a business set up, you want to really work particularly hard to get them into the habit in their first year to pay tax. But another example would be we did find some differences according to the level of the tax. So someone who owes a large amounts of tax, you know, £30,000 plus, we did find some differentials where they were more responsive to messages which referred to the content, you know, so like paying your taxes really enables us to pay for, um, you know, hospitals and teachers and so on, appear to work better in those. And you can sort of see why, because if you owe £30,000, like, well, you know, that's a teaching assistant or whatever, right? Literally. So there are some differences, but um, in many areas, we actually have relatively limited information inside government, partly because we don't have the data breakdown. And one of the things linked almost to the earlier question, if you want to do that much, much more refined, which message would work better with Caroline versus someone else? Um, we'd actually need to know a lot about you. And it raises the question of how much you want the state and others to be able to do that. Think Cambridge Analytica, et cetera. So the short answer is there are definitely some effects on younger people. There are course differences. We've seen it on COVID. Um, I'm mean, actually young people are often much less attentive to lots of messages, for example, around COVID in general. They just, you know, not entirely irrationally because you think, well, your risk is less, but they just don't attend to messages as carefully and they're less likely to comply often. So there are some differences. On the other hand, young people, of course, are much more responsive to issues around climate change and so on. Um, there was a question around um, big household switches like boilers and so on. Yeah, I mean, this is not going to be easy. We all know that. Um, it's a good example because it's, look, price matters, except for some very early adopters who might move. And what people kind of want to have is they want to have their cake and eat it. To link it a bit to the earlier question, there's very detailed work being done right from the 1970s about value shifts, which suggests that younger generations, certainly from the 70s, what was described as post-materialist, right? And on, on when they were asked to choose between saving the planet, environmental issues versus having a good job or price, they switched from the, the parents who used to say, you know, what really matters is having a good job and, um, you know, how much things cost, et cetera. Younger generations at that period shifted to saying, actually, we should save the planet. But I think it was a misnomer in Engelhardt's work because when you really put it apart, instead of being a forced choice, what you actually find is people, younger generations, want to have their cake and eat it. So, Caroline, you, for example, you want to save the planet. You want to do meaningful work, but actually you kind of do want to be paid as well. In fact, you quite like to be well paid, I suspect, right? So you want to have your cake and eat it in the same way with the boilers. Actually, yeah, we want to do the right thing, but is it really going to cost more? So often you have to try and, of course, price does matter. But the other things matter as well. And in particular, you mentioned the disruption and also I'd say the unfamiliarity. So similarly with electric vehicle, one of the things that puts people off is they think the elect driving electric vehicles can be really weird and different. And so one of the key things is just to get people to do their first test drive. And they're like, oh my God, this actually is you know, not so different. So we have to move it on the price and we have to move markets along. And we have to think about those other factors as well. And there are some early adopters who will do it without the price, but for most, it has to be price and. There was a last question about um, waste, obesity, et cetera. I'm not sure if I've got it all, but yes, there's clearly an interaction between all these things where some of the right things look like they're a kind of win, 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 and ideally we can line them up. Um, so, you know, um, going back to, should I say no to the straw in Islington, or actually, would it be better to say, actually, you know what, today I'll have a veggie burger, you know? Um, things that are simultaneously might be better for your health, but are also better for the planet, and where you can align all those things together um, as a kind of win-win package. Thank you. Okay, um, almost out of time, but just one uh, final round of questions, which is around, I suppose, organizational um, behavioral systems. So um, Jim Bignall asked, what nudges can we take to encourage businesses to um, 
take environmental issues more seriously. Um, Joanna is asking what can be done at a workplace level to change behaviour. Um, and um, a final question from um, Matt Stavrel, which is um, what is stopping the behavioural insights team from conducting more research to reduce carbon consumption and driving the rapid market change we need to see and that government is failing in motivating so far? Well, what a good question, that last one particularly. And it wasn't even a plant. Um, I'm aware of the time, so I'll just try and do it very briefly. Um, there are clearly differences, but are, of course there are lots of things you can do around organizational and business behavior. Um, I tried to touch on it, and I went, went through it very fast, but I would say one of the cutting edges really is around market design, we would call it. So deshrouding, where you particularly can inform consumers, which tips a market in a significant way. So as you were on a, you know, some of you will know when in 2010 this stuff was kicking off in the coalition government. Um, one of the people pushing it was Steve Hilton, who'd previously done a lot of work on good business and so on. And one of the key questions is, you know, in a, in a deep sense, is good are good businesses the ones that are winning the race, right? For customers, indeed for employees and so on. And it hits, um, again, in a classical economic world, it doesn't matter because everyone's a rational utility maximizer. We have perfect information. Consumers will make the best choice. But in the real world, that's just not true. And there are all kinds of shroudings and imperfections about markets. And, but the good news is they are substantially fixable. It is, it is possible to inform consumers and have better feedback loops. And we've shown, I haven't got time to go into it, and if someone wants to follow up with me afterwards. In fact, we're putting out a report even this week around applying behavioral economics to economic policy. And a lot of the central issues are around that, about better market design. Um, so that I said, in a, in a deep sense, good businesses are the ones that win and you design markets to make sure that's the case. That relates similarly in relation to workforce uh, or workplace behavior as well, right? Um, and again, I haven't got kind, kind time to go into it. What's stopping us? Well, obviously we've all been pretty busy on COVID. Um, and, um, but I mean, I genuinely think this is a good point to kind of draw it to a conclusion. Um, but I, I really hope, and I'm sure a lot of us hope that the one thing COVID has given us all is a colossal kick up the backside <laughs> to realize that we're in it together, but it is also possible for us to affect change in the world as well as a big disruption, right? And we've got COP26 and we've had G20 and we've got G7. Like this is our moment, but God's sake, let us deploy all our resources to do this. Um, is part of it, um, of course, funding and the research profile? Absolutely, of course it is. You know, BIT, you know, it's, I think it's a cute, it's an important organization in lots of ways, but it's small. Um, there are lots of kind of historic distortions, anchor points, you put it in relation to what we spend our money on in relation to the research environment. Um, and, um, you know, what it is that governments do, how little, frankly, R&D that governments do to try and find new and better solutions. And one of my great hopes in the coming year is that we'll also see the likes of some of the big foundations like Gates and Bloomberg, not only back the kind of hard technology, you know, if you're an Asimov fund, it's the first foundation, if that means anything to you, the hard science, et cetera, is we have to marry that with it's a slight, if you notice, Asimov is a slightly problematic example in some ways, but the second foundation, in other words, the psychology, right, the, the soft aspect to it, because if we don't do that, our technical solutions alone will fail. So I feel quite upbeat. We're working also with our partner, Nesta, um, on this, and with Ravi Guramathi, who's just come on charge to do that. He's very keen to do it as well. But on the one hand, I feel really upbeat about what's possible, but we do have to deploy some resources across our various you know, foundations, um, governments and so on, to, to do it seriously, right? Medical science has achieved fantastic advances, but it also receives significant resources to achieve that. And we have to do some of the same in relation to get the kind of shifts that people have asked questions about today. Thank you so much, David. That's been absolutely um, uh, fascinating. And we, we do build these kind of um, sessions as a dose of inspiration for everyone. But I think the dose of optimism and ambition is also um, really, really um, sort of necessary and, and valuable. So thank you.
Um, thank you to everyone that has joined us, um, whether over Zoom, YouTube, or social media. Um, the this is the penultimate day of the green recovery festival um beyond the festival if you're interested in finding out what we have planned for next year including our own activities around cop 26 please get in touch with myself or a colleague at the crowd thank you once again to everyone who submitted a question very sorry we couldn't get through all of them and thank you so much david i appreciate it. it's been a super busy few months for you so it's been really fantastic that you can join us um, and we hope to see you all again soon. Thank you.